Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Bill Griswold, director of the Cleveland Museum of Art, and it is my very great pleasure to welcome you all to the museum and to this year's second annual Pauline and Joseph Dagenfelder Distinguished Lecture in Chinese Art. The Cleveland Museum of Art has collected Chinese art from the very beginning. Our collection is today recognized all over the world as one of the finest such holdings outside China. And the vision and taste and connoisseurship and erudition of generations of curators and donors and of such directors as Sherman Lee have over time informed the development of a holding of absolutely astonishing breadth and depth and quality representative of China's greatest artistic achievements. This afternoon, I would like to offer my and our collective gratitude to Pauline and Joseph Dagenfelder. With the establishment of the Pauline and Joseph Dagenfelder Family Endowment for Lectures in the Field of Chinese Art, they have supported the generation and dissemination of new scholarship paving the way for new audiences to discover the artistic accomplishments of one of the world's greatest and most ancient civilizations. And that impact is apparent even today in our galleries of Chinese art, which I was delighted to see are now full. Without Pauline and Joseph, we would not be in this room today, and we would not have the pleasure of hearing from a scholar of international renown about a particularly fascinating aspect of Chinese art and culture. Please join me in thanking Joseph and Pauline. This year, we welcome Lothar Lederose, Senior Professor of East Asian Art History at Heidelberg University, who, uh, despite yesterday's snowstorm, made it here from Germany by midnight last night. Uh, so we're really thrilled that he is here. <laughs> and to introduce our distinguished speaker, uh, I am delighted to give the podium to Clarissa von Spee, our curator of Chinese art and chair of the museum's Department of Asian Art. Dr. von Spee joined us in Cleveland just two years ago, having previously been curator at the British Museum. And even in the short time that she has been with us, she has enriched our collection and programs, further elevating the stature of one of the most famous parts of our collection. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Clarissa Bonspe. Good afternoon. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you today the speaker of our second distinguished lecture in Chinese art, Lothar Lederose, Senior Professor of East Asian Art History at Heidelberg University. And as Bill has already mentioned, we are so glad to have him here after two flight cancellations, a delayed flight, and um, with great determination, he made it here after midnight. Having Lothar Lederose speaking to us today is not only a great honor for the museum, it is also a particular joy for me. Some of you may know I received my PhD degree from Heidelberg University, and Professor Lederose was what we would call in Germany my doctor father. Although this has been a while ago, we have always kept in communication, and his advice, teaching, and ideas have guided me through all these years. Lothar Lederose is one of the most distinguished scholars of Chinese art history worldwide. He was educated at the universities of Cologne, Bonn, Paris, Taipei, and Heidelberg, where he received his PhD. 
He then continued his studies uh, at Princeton and Harvard and spent several years in East Asia, including work at the National uh, Palace Museum in Taipei and a research fellowship at Tokyo University. Since 1976, Lothar Lederose is professor of East Asian art history at Heidelberg University. He is one of a handful of scholars outside Asia who have come to grips with the art of calligraphy, traditionally the most valued art form in East Asia. Lederose's book on the famous calligrapher Mi Fu and the classical tradition of Chinese calligraphy published by Princeton University in 1979, is widely read in, still widely read in China and the West. At the time I was a student at Heidelberg University, his studies focused on classical Chinese paintings and cataloging the collection of the Chinese paintings at the Asian Art Museum in Berlin. In the 1990s, Lothar Lederose explored new avenues of research on what he calls modular art production in China. His question was, how did the Chinese manage to produ produce artistic works of a very high quality in huge numbers and often in very little time? In 2002, the ten, uh, the, his book, 10,000 Things, Module and Mass Production in Chinese Art, won the Joseph Levinson Book Prize of the Association of Asian Studies for the best book of the year on traditional China. If you ever asked yourself how the over 7,000 life-size terracotta soldiers excavated from the tomb of the first emperor were produced in probably only 11 years, this book will give you an answer. If I had to recommend one book that gives you insight and understanding of the creativity and artistic production in China, whether porcelain, bronzes, architecture, painting, or calligraphy, this is a book I would name, 10,000 Things, Module and Mass Production in Chinese Art. In 2005, Lothar Lederose was awarded the prestigious Balsan Prize for the history of the art of Asia. The Balsan Foundation awarded him with the prize, quote, for his outstanding work on the history of Chinese and Japanese art and for his innovative ideas contributing to the creation of a modern vision of the role of East Asian art in global art. Over the past few years, Lothar Ledrosa has shifted his attention towards Buddhism in Chinese culture and art, studying Buddhist scriptures engraved on stone. Working in collaboration with the prestigious Chinese Academy of Sciences, Social Sciences in Beijing and involving scholars from Japan and Taiwan, Lothar Ledrosa aims to document, translate and analyze these inscriptions and produce virtual models of the sites. Provided with research funds from the Heidelberg Academy of Sciences for 16 years, this research project of enormous scope is the topic of today's lecture. Under the open sky, Buddhist sutras in Chinese mountains. Please welcome Lothar Lederose. Thank you very much, Mr. Griswold, for bringing me here. I'm very glad to be here, I must say. And uh, thank you very much, Carissa, for this very personal and kind uh, introduction. Uh, I was here the last time I came up these stairs here 40 years ago, and I think most of you were not born then. <laughs> but uh, that, uh, that was at the occasion of the exhibition of eight dynasties of Chinese painting. And at that time I talked about hells, Chinese hells. 
now I have matured a bit and I want to talk about sky. <laughs> I mean, as you get older, you have to prepare for all eventualities. In <laughs> so uh, I will just start here with this. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we all know this mountain, Mount Rushmore in South Dakota, in the middle of the North American continent. From 1927 to 1941, the sculptor Gutsum Berklum and his son Lincoln Berklum carved the colossal portraits of these four American presidents into the rock, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, and uh, and <laughs> Abraham Lincoln, yeah. Okay, <laughs> this, this formerly very remote, inconspicuous and unknown mountain thus became a visible and tangible symbol of the rock solid foundation and the everlasting political power of the American nation. 1200 years earlier, um, yeah, 1200 years earlier, in 730 AD, devout Buddhist monks began to carve this gigantic statue of the Buddha, of the Buddha Maitreya, into the sandstone in Lershan, Sichuan, Sichuan province. And there, thereby, this formerly also very little known mountain was transformed into a symbol of Buddhist religious power and actually became the source of this, or one source of this very power. The Buddha resides in this mountain. He is present here. He can be physically experienced, venerated and worshiped, and from here his power emanates. But today I will not continue with talking with, uh, on sculpture but I will talk about calligraphy. And Clarissa just said that calligraphy is one of my pet topics in, of research, in, has been all my life, and there's, calligraphy is such a rich area, and now I have gone into calligraphy engraved into stone. And I'll show you some sites here in this very remote part of Shandong province. Uh, one of our uh, perks in doing this project, which Clarissa mentioned we do since 2005, is that we get into really remote areas of China and we learn China to, to see China, parts of China which normally normal tourists would never see. And one is here. And in this really uh, remote uh, part, uh, rocks, in, uh, I mean, uh, mountains in the center of Shandong province, there you find these inscribed Buddhist um, names of, in this case, of a Buddha, of a Buddha, a name of a Buddha called the Great Buddha King of Emptiness. Uh, Great Buddha King of Emptiness. And by carving this name of this Buddha into this rock, like in the Lershan in Sichuan before, uh, the Buddha becomes present in this rock, in this mountain. And his power emanates, emanates from this mountain. This carving was done around 560 AD, and it's about nine meters high from, oh yes, you can see here, <laughs> The scale is indicated. Um, <laughs> the, but uh, Buddha names, this is one, uh, one of the Buddha names, they are one of three groups of engravings in uh, the mountains of Shandong, which I will present to you today. And the other two groups are brief abstracts of Buddhist teachings, and the third are sutras, sacred scriptures or parts of these. And then, in addition, there is a fourth category, uh, colophones to the sacred texts, paratexts, so to speak, which name donors and give historical information about the engravings. But 
those I will only mention in passing today. Now, this is a, a digital image, and we have, you see, the surroundings of this Da Kung Wangfo, of this great Buddha here. There are other inscriptions left and right, and maybe I should just uh, mention that unlike in other monotheistic religions, I mean like Christianity, uh, where there we have only one Yahweh or one Allah or one Christ, in Buddhism we have many Buddhas. There are in, indeed innumerable Buddhas. And these Buddhas reside in different world ages and in our world age, in the present world age, it was the historical Buddha Shakyamuni who lived about around 500 BC in India. And uh, he is the Buddha of our world age. But there are others, millions maybe, of uh, other Buddha lands existed years ago, millions of years ago. And even today there are these Buddha lands somewhere out in space, in outer space. So the Buddhist concept of the universe is actually not so different from what modern astronomers tell us. Now, the Buddha uh, from the uh, depths of the cosmos that are conjured up here, there is, are, there is I'm sorry, have to go back, well, I want to go, yeah, here, uh, <laughs> here they, they are lined up. There is a row, of, in a row of 13 Buddhas, and I'll show you the, the rock. Uh, wait, yeah, um, too fast. Uh, this is the, the rock I wanted to show, uh, yeah. This is the rock, and they are engraved here. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But anyway, what I want to show is that you cannot really see them very well on the rock. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, you can see them better on this, on this rubbing. And uh, now I'm, I'm showing you the rubbings, or go into the rubbing. Uh, there uh, are... Um, this, this row of, um, of Buddhas begins from here, and it ends with here with Shakyamuni, which is the Buddha of our world age. And I won't go into very detail, but these are the Buddha, seven Buddhas of the past. So there is a cosmic time in here, and they are lived millions of years ago. And then there is a spatial cosmic space. These are Buddhas which exist at this very moment, but in other world ages. And there is the famous Guan Yin, uh, I have to get my glasses, uh, which is known very well in uh, China and in Japan, and uh, uh, here, Guan Yin, and, and other Buddhas which we know. I'm not going, uh, no, I want to show one, one more. I want to mention at least one more. This is this, this is again Shakyamuni Buddha of our world age, and next to him is another Buddha. It, he is, she is called Buddha with the complete attributes of a thousand, ten thousand rays of light. And this Buddha is a very special one because it's originally a she. It's a woman, and she was the wife of the historic Buddha Shakyamuni. But in, later, in a later incarnation, she will also become a Buddha, and uh, here is, she is already called a Buddha here. This name means Buddha. So this is an example how these engravings in the rock show us something which we do not find in texts. In texts, this lady is not mentioned in such a uh, capacity of becoming a Buddha later, or hardly mentioned. And so this, these, these engravings tell us something about the role of women, actually, in 6th uh, century China. Now I just go back once more to this first, first Buddha. So the, uh, yeah. And here you see the rock 
you see the engraving in the rock, you see, and how the brush strokes are emulated, engraved in the rocks. It's, a, it's an amazing piece of art, actually. And uh, this Buddha here is um, another one here. Yes, also engraved here in the rock from here to here. And this is uh, 363 meters high and one, more than one meter wide. And wow, can you imagine how this was done in the, on the rock? It's hard to imagine. I don't know how it was done. I mean, you, it's hard to imagine that somebody climbs on a scaffolding and then wheels his brush like in one meter wide uh, strokes. One possibility would be that it was first done on paper, on the ground, on the floor, and something like this Japanese lady does here with a broom, big like a, a brush, big like a broom. But then there's another problem. Maybe in the sixth century they didn't have such big pieces of paper at that time, and so they may have used cloth, and they may have written this on a cloth and then put it on the rock and then engraved it in the rock. That's one uh, theory, but we don't know exactly. Anyway, let's uh, go on, and here is the map of all the sites where we find these inscriptions. This is Shandong, and we just saw uh, this here in Hongdingshan, and there are others here, and then there's here Mount Tai we will see, and we will see here around the city of Zhoucheng. But I will not continue with Buddha names now, but come to the second group of inscriptions, as I mentioned. Uh, these are the short passages, abstracts of larger texts, which contain essentials from the Buddhist scriptures. Now, the, as you know, the Buddhist scriptures are an immense treasure trove of human thought and wisdom, knowledge. They deal with all the fundamental, fundamental philosophical issues, with ontological questions. They talk about uh, what is a being, what is time, what is space. They talk about ethical issues, how do, are you a good human, they explain, I'm sorry, they explain the relations between humans, the relations and uh, one finds also all kinds of theoretical discourses, for example, what is the relation between image and reality. It's very interesting for art historians to read these things. But then there are discussions of linguistics, medicine, hygiene, psychology, psychology, botanics, I mean, you name it. But underlying all these dis discourses, like a basso continuo, is the twin question. What is the meaning of life and how should we live it? Now, the, I'm showing you a mountain here, Mount Sulai, where is it? I think here, no, I'm sorry. Here, 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 Mount Sulai. Uh, this is Mount Sulai. And you see up here, this rock. On this rock is an inscription. And uh, show you the inscription from near, I mean, you see how remote this area is there. Uh, this is this rock which you just saw, and there is the inscription is here. It's hard to read. And these are the people, some people of my group, photographing the inscriptions here on this rock with the letter. It's not easy sometimes to document these inscriptions. And the problem is, of course, that these inscriptions you don't see from beneath. They're too small, and from beneath, uh, it's quite different from this sign, <laughs> which you can see from afar. But in the, the Buddhist inscriptions have their own power, and the power emanates over the lands, even if you don't see it. And here another in, a mountain called Mount Yi, and it's also in Shandong, I mean, already the first emperor emperor of China, uh, visited this mountain and he left an inscription commemorating his, 
unification of the empire, which happened in 221 BC. And so this mountain has become famous in history. And again, there is an inscription up here, very up here, and you can see it from near, it's here. Again, you have to know that it is there. But uh, again, the power of this inscription emanates over the land. Uh, now, uh, I go, come back to this uh, digital um, view of which we saw before, and uh, one passage, which uh, I'm not talking about these short passages with abstracts of Buddhist teaching, one passage consists of 98 characters, and it's uh, here, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> this is too sensitive, here, it's here. It's, it's, you have to climb up here. It's very hard to reach. You don't normally you you don't see this, but um, this passage is a uh, definition. It has a, it contains a definition of the Buddha, and here again it's engraved in stone. And again, I show you a rubbing because in stone you don't see. You cannot read it so well. In, even in the rubbing, may be difficult, but. Uh, this is the rubbing, and I'll read you from here. The Buddha said, and the Buddha gives here a definition of himself. And the definition is the uh, Prajnaparamita, which is the ultimate wisdom. And uh, this definition of himself is paradoxical. You cannot really define the Buddha. You cannot say what he is like, so you have to, can only say what he is not like. And this is uh, this paradoxical perdition. The Buddha said, Prajnaparamita is without born, boundary, without born, without name, without attributes, inconceivable, without refuge, without sandbank, without sin, without merit, without obscurity, without illumination. Like the realm of the law, it is without demarcation and also limitless in number. This is named Prajnaparamita. Why is this? Because <coughs> it is unthought and unconditioned. Now, this text is, of course, almost impossible to understand or maybe literally not understandable. Uh, it, because it says the Buddha's nature cannot be expressed in words. So this definition of the Buddha in negative terms is actually something which we, we find parallels in other uh, religions. I mean, there is this so-called ne negative theology in Christianity and also in Islam. So what do you do with such a text? You meditate in front of it. You meditate in front of it. This text lends itself to meditation. And in fact, there is a bench. This is this text here, and there is a bench, a natural rock bench, where the meditator can sit. And he meditates like we know this famous painting by Liang Kai, around, done around 1200 AD. It shows one of the, it shows the, the uh, Bodhidharma, the foundational patriarch or first patriarch of the Zen of Zen Buddhism or Chan Buddhism, and his student and Bodhidharma is meditating in front of a wall, and he he went he meditated for nine years, and then there's another famous painting of the same subject uh, here by Seshu, a monk a Japanese monk painter done in. 1596, and here again you have behind Bodhidharma his disciple, uh, Hui Ke. He is standing here, and he has just cut off his left forearm and presents it to the master to show his sincerity, silently waiting in the snow to be accepted as his disciple. 
I think I told my students in Heidelberg never to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, but we asked somebody to pose as a meditator, and this is how it looks. You see, he sits there in front of this uh, text which I just read to you, and he has the characters right in front of his eyes. So, this is a theory. Not everybody believes this, but I think it's a nice theory. And we know that no characters were carved on Bodhidharma's wall, who sat there for nine years, but to do to engrave characters was an innovation of the monks in Shandong here, to engrave characters here. But we don't know much about the life of Bodhidharma. He's a quasi-mythical figure, but we know quite much about this student, Hui Ke. He came to the city of Ye in, in 534 and immediately became famous as a teacher of meditation. And uh, he is known as a historical figure. And when this inscription here was made, Ye, the city of Ye, was the capital of the northern Qi dynasty to which this area belonged, and Hui Ke was still alive. So that, I think, is a good argument uh, for this theory. Now, uh, I just ventured a bit into the historical situation, and I would like to say a bit more about the geographical and historical context in which we find ourselves here. And, uh, I begin with a very simple, simplified map here showing Eurasia in uh, around 800 AD. And as we all know, at that time, there were two large empires in the Eurasian continent here, the Roman Empire in the west and the Empire of the Han in the east. And they were comparable in many ways. I mean, each had around 60 million people, in population of 60 million, and they had one emperor, a lean administration, a net of highways, as well as a common language and script of writing, which guaranteed the coherence of the political uh, setup. And both Rome and China used large infantry armies to protect their empires from assaults from the outside. And for that purpose, they also built walls several hundred kilometers in length. The, on the one hand, the Limes, and on the other hand, the, the famous Great Wall. You can see the Great Wall sort of kind of indicated in here, the Limes. Uh, but these <coughs> walls could not stem the pressure of people from Inner Asia, among them the Huns in the west and, and the Xiongnu in the east and many others. And so in the third, fourth centuries, the two empires broke up. And they, then we get the uh, western and eastern uh, Roman Empire, and we get the northern and southern Chinese Empire. Now, it was another remarkable parallel between these two empires that their breakup, political breakup, was accompanied by the invasion and expansion of a new religion. Here, Christianity, and here, Buddhism. And both religions were not tied to a political territory, and both had sacred scriptures in several languages. And both creeds were radically metaphysical, yearning for a world beyond ours. Our world to them was a veil of tears. Obviously, to the people of the time, the break, of, break up of the empires was a calamity that needed to be healed. And the big question was whether the new religion could play a constructive role in this process. Different answers were given. In Rome, as we know, Nero persecuted the Christians down into the catacombs, but in 313, Constantine gained victory in the sign of the cross. And in China, where the north had in the meantime been divided into two, into two parts, so three altogether, the situation also was similar under the northern Qi dynasty in the east here, 
Buddhism flourished as never before. And the Qi dynasty lasted from 550 to 579. And there were some 30,000 monasteries, they say, the sources tell us, of course, large and very small ones too. And three million monks, that was about 10% of the entire population. And these people created the rock engravings under the open skies, which we have seen so far. Then uh, there is one other impressive corpus of physical remains that have come down to us from this period, testifying to the Buddhist zeal uh, of these people in the Northern Qi Dynasty. And this corpus are stone sculptures and they are fantastic corpus in number, amazing in numbers and in quality. And in recent years, uh, spectacular finds were made in Qingzhou, also in Shandong, and uh, they have been dug up. Ah, I have to go here. They have been dug up um, from under the ground where they have been for 1,500 years. And it's not quite clear why they were there, but probably they were smashed in the Buddhist persecution of which, about which I'll be talking in a minute, and were buried underground. And having been underground for such a long time allowed the colors to stay. And you see these are wonderful colors on, on, on these polychrome framing on these stone statues. And uh, these fragments now give us an idea of what, how, one, how colorful these uh, sculptures originally looked. And here in your wonderful museum, which actually I should say it's really one of the great museums of the world. I mean, I'm so happy to be here. I just had a quick tour before I came here and I saw some of these uh, sculptures which I'm going show you, it just show you one, just a few, um, like this one. And here, here you can see some traces of color still. It's from this same period. And, <laughs> but it, formerly there was even more color, more color. Or here in this configuration also, from here in this museum, which we just saw an hour ago, wonderful piece. Again, with some color, but there was more color. Now, uh, let's go back to the history. The Northern Qi Dynasty <coughs> was not going to last. Emperor Wu of the neighboring Zhou Dynasty to the west, we saw the division in the Northern, northern China in two parts, division in two parts. Uh, Emperor Wu launched an atrocious Buddhist, Buddhist persecution first in 574 in his own realm in the northern Zhou and then in the late land of Qi which he conquered. And the capital of Qi, Ye, where this uh, Huike was active, which I mentioned, whom I mentioned before, this capital fell on February 22nd, 577. And then the emperor had 500 high clergymen from Northern Qi assembled in front of his throne and he declared, declared them his irrevocable will to eradicate their faith. The monks stood silently, tears in their eyes. Only one of them spoke up and he warned the emperor that for his bad deeds he would have to suffer in hell. We can imagine that this monk looked somewhat like this figure here in the museum. And, uh, but the emperor did not care. He gave order to dissolve the monasteries, melt down the holy icons made of copper and gold and turn them into coins, I mean the copper and the gold, and burn the scriptures written on paper and silk. His aim was to build up his military to such a strength that it might enable him to eventually conquer all of China and to reunite the empire. All monks were defrocked and pressed into military service. Yet some monasteries somewhere may still have continued to make icons such as this fantastic Buddha figure 
again here in your museum. I mean, your museum is really a treasure trove. <laughs> it's wonderful. Um, these Buddhist sources tell us, uh, back to history, the Buddhist sources tell us that this monarch, Wu, was not going to last. Little more than a year had happened after his conquest of the eastern, of the northern Qi. The emperor was stricken by a malicious leprosy. No medicine could cure him, and within seven days, the 36-year-old monarch perished on June 21st, 578. Although his successor instantly reversed the most severe anti-Buddhist measures, measures, the Northern Zhou Dynasty was doomed in 581. It was overpowered by the Sui Dynasty. The, its Emperor Wen was an ardent Buddhist believer, and he had the Buddhist establishment on his side. And in due course, in 589, also it conquered the Chen Dynasty to the south, thereby reuniting the empire uh, as it had been before. So after three and, and a half centuries of division, the emperor, empire was reunited. So this emperor in 589, with the help of the Buddhists, is accomplished what in Europe neither Western nor Eastern Roman empires nor all other later emperors such as Charlemagne or Charles V or Napoleon achieved to, uh, uh, failed to achieve that is political unity. And in the days after Brexit, I think we have not much hope to do it now. <laughs> but in addition, of course, uh, to the help which the emperor had from the Buddhist clergy and the establishment, there were other reasons why he succeeded in reuniting the empire. Um, this is the geography, of course, in the system of script. But uh, the emperor was obviously a shrewd politician. As soon as he had come to the throne, he issued an edict obliging everyone in his realm to donate a very small coin to the Buddha that was meant to mitigate the agonies of Emperor Wu, who was of the Northern Zhou, who was suffering in hell. Yeah. Now, we go uh, to the, come to the third part, which I want to show, and these are sutras. Uh, these uh, sutras are, of course, lengthy texts, and uh, they are engraved only in part because they are too long. But uh, we, I'm going to show you two here on Mount Gang and Mount Tie here, and then later one on uh, Mount Tai here. This, let's start with Mount Gang. This text is not engraved in one coherent a piece of rock, but it's parceled out over more than 30 rock faces, rock faces and rock boulders. And here you see our group searching for them. We look where these are, and they are, it's a, an entire text, and you have to climb up the mountain and you read the text as you go up. And the, the text is a beautiful description or a description of the beautiful mountain in Lanka in India where the Buddha once dwelt and preached. And I read you the inscription which we find here. It's a rather long inscription. It says, thus I have heard at one time the Buddha dwelt by the shore of the great ocean on the peak of Mount Malaya in the city of Lanka, a mountain formed of all manner of things of gem-like nature. The gems are strewn uh, together, sparkling and illuminating with a fiery brilliance like hundreds and thousands of suns shining and reflected off golden mountains. Further, there are countless flower gardens and fragrant trees, veritable gems of in fragrant groves, where light breezes blow, rustling the branches and moving the leaves. Hundreds and thousands of wondrous fragrances at once spread afar, and hundreds and thousands of wondrous tones all at once sound together. 
Within the layered cliffs they twist and turn, there are everywhere halls of transcendence and numerous abodes, innumerable grottoes and caves formed of masses of gems inside and outside. They are so utterly luminous that the light of the sun and moon can no longer be seen. So this text uh, evokes in a very flowery language uh, what the mountain looked like where the Buddha preaches and then it goes on talking about his preaching and then it says the Buddha was dwelling along with a great gathering of monks and a great multitude of bodhisattvas I mean the, these beings which are one level below the Buddha all of whom from the various kinds of Buddha lands or the other quarters of the cosmos had arrived together and gathered into an assembly these bodhisattvas are completely endowed with the incalculable samadhis of mastery, giving them supernatural power with which they swiftly go around converting. They excel in the five dharmas, three kinds of intrinsic nature, eight kinds of consciousnesses, and two kinds of no-self, and they have ma mastered them utterly. So I'm sorry to have read this very long text, but it gives you an idea what is engraved on these mountains. And now we look at some uh, passages. Uh, this is the map here, which we finally came up with after we had identified all these stones from B1, uh, B1 and B3 and B2 and B3 have rolled down the hill and it goes on and on and on and you read the text which I just mentioned and until you come to B33 somewhere here, B31. Uh, so when we start, you see here, this, this is the mountain you start with. And this is again the rubbing, and this is the entire text which I read, or more or less read, and in pink is indicated what is on these respective stones. And here it begins, thus I have heard, at one time the Bhagavad, the Buddha, dwelt by the shore of the great ocean on the peak of Mount Malaya in the city of, and then it continues, city, city here uh, of Lanka. This is just on another stone. And this is amazing calligraphy, isn't it? Fantastic calligraphy. I mean, just these two characters, Lanka. And then it goes on like hundreds and thousands of uh, suns shining and reflected off golden mountains. This is, you see here. And then we go on further. There are countless flower gardens and fragrant trees. This is written here. Veritable gems in fragrant groves where light breezes blow, rustling the branches, moving the leaves. Uh, these are, by the way, these are sort of uh, unsolicited people who take rubbings. They are not allowed to do this, but I mean, it's hard to prevent them. You, you can, this is out in the open, as I showed you, it's very far away. And they go there and they make rubbings and they sell them and they get a lot of money, of course. Um, now, when you read, when the pilgrim who goes up the mountain, or the, who go up the mountains, read this, what I just read to you, he feels like he himself is ascending Mount Malaya in India. He feels like he is in India. He hears these branches and hears the sounds and so on, wonderful music. And that means the mountain where the Buddha preached in India has been transferred with this inscription, with the help of this inscription, to China, in the, into the homeland of these mountains. Uh, of, of these monks, which we saw. And here you see this is one character, only he, one and one of our students reading, trying to read this, or uh, making notes of this character. And another character is beneath here. It's, the, it's hard to, we have to really discover it. It's I mean, at one time, right? They sound together and, um, and we have, i you know, show you, uh, this lady here is lying here. You see her head and arm, and she is measuring, measuring this character. And we hope there is no earthquake coming now. <laughs> so uh, it goes on. Then this amazing rock says the Buddha was dwelling along with the great gathering of monks in a great multitude of bodhisattvas, all of whom had come, a great multitude of that, all of whom had come from the other quarters in the other Buddha lands and 
from the various quarters. And uh, these are the quarters I mentioned in the beginning of my lecture, that there are other, out in the cosmos, there are other Buddha lands, millions of years or of, of kilometers or miles away, and the Buddhas come. They come to this place here, and they all assemble. And then come the bodhisattvas, I mean the people, the, the beings who teach, the monks who have come up, and uh, these bodhisattvas are mentioned here, and they are the completely endow endowed with incalculable wisdom, and finally they understand, they excel in the two kinds of no-self. This is the two kinds of no-self which they have mastered utterly. And here, this is Professor Luo Zhao from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences in Beijing who got me into this whole project and to whom I have to be eternally grateful to get me, bring me there. And he explains, I'm sorry, I'm always hitting this. Uh, sorry, sorry. He explained to us the text and for example, the two kinds of no self is the knowledge that humans have no self and secondly, that the knowledge that phenomena have no self or essence. So it's this total negation in Buddhism. Well, unfortunately, we do not know what kind of rituals were performed. There must have been rituals, of course, in this, on these mountains, but we, there are no records. And we may assume that the monks and pilgrims walked up here, took a seat among the stones, and felt that they were in the presence of the Buddha and maybe an eminent monk or abbot may have perhaps impersonated the Buddha and preached to them this Lankavatara Sutra of which the engraved portion is the introduction. He may have preached the Sutra as it goes on, the parts which are not inscribed, possibly. possibly. Now, the second Sutra I want to uh, show is here on this Mount Tie, Iron Mountain, so called. It has a colophon dated September 23rd, 579, that is just one year after the death of Emperor Wu. And engraved here is a long passage from the so-called vast and universal Great Collection Sutra. And here is uh, our group taking photos of this sutra, and here you can see some of the engraved characters here. Um, from the air, this, one sees that this engraving has the shape of a stele. A stele, this is a late stele, but it shows you the type, a main uh, body, stone body, and then the title and some dragons surrounding the title, and the whole thing is situated on a turtle. And here you have the same thing. This is the body of the stele laid on the rock. It's 60 meters high. It's a giant stele. And there is the title of the stele and the uh, dragons. And then there are some colophones. And there, is even, there are even two turtles because the stele is so heavy. Uh, we, we made this drawing, or yeah, partly you see this, the stele with the dragons and the turtle here. Now, uh, there is this colophon engraved on the left side, which uh, gives us the date, and even the colophon is 17 meters high. It's the highest or the largest colophon in Chinese history, I think. Huge. And they, they, we made, or had, they helped us to have rubbings made. And when we exhibited them in, in the museum in Cologne, the, because 17 meters, I mean, unlike your museum, <laughs> the museum in Cologne doesn't have such high, high walls, so we had them to hang them from the ceiling, like the Book of the Sky by the modern painter Xu Bing. Now, this... Uh, Colophon is an amazing piece of literature. It, uh, it's, 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 it's amazing, yeah, it's a wonderful piece of literature. And among other things, it anchors this, this sutra in space and time. It says that the 
Mount Tai, where the sutra is engraved, lies at the cross point of two axes. One axis, major, the major axis, runs from uh, north to south, and uh, in the more now north is Mount Tai. It's about 98 kilometers away, and it's hard to see. On most days, you never can see it, but maybe on a very clear day, if you. This is Mount Thier, if you climb up here, Mount Gang, which we just saw where the sutra is parceled out into 31 boulders. From here, you might be able to see Mount Tai. And then the colophon says on the south uh, is, uh, is the Mount E here. On the colophon tells us that the axis continues. On the south is Mount E, and here is the map. This is Mount Thier, Mount, uh, Mount Thier, and this is Mount E. And we saw Mount E before. I showed you uh, the tip where we have the engraving of the sutra, and I said that Mount E is famous in Chinese history because the first emperor erected a stele. And the first emperor also react, uh, erected a stele on Mount Tai, so we have this very prominent axis prominent both in political significance and in the historical significance for the history of the empire. And now the Buddhists place their Mount Thier right on this axis. So thereby superseding, in a way, uh, the ancient political historical significance in claiming this now as a Buddha land. And then there is a, a smaller east-west axis uh, the eastern point is here Mount Jen, all mentioned in that colophon, and then the western point is a few, few hills which we couldn't identify. But this axis is a small axis, the east-west axis. And, but this cosmological crossings we find often in China. It's not by far not the only one, and the most famous one you all know, this is uh, Tiananmen, the big north south axis runs from the throne of the emperor from the throne of the emperor through the imperial palace and then through the city of beijing and then through the entire empire and uh, it's crossed by this Chang'anjie, the big biggest street in uh, in beijing and here at the node so to speak is the mausoleum of for mao zedong but the Colophon uh, of 579 also places the sutra in time, a sacred in this cosmic time, and I just have to say a few words about the situation there. Uh, in the, I'll just show you. This is the sutra, a part of the colophon, which they where they take the rubbings. I mean, the, you need several people to do this, 17 meters high colophon. And here they talk about the metal and stone. They last for a long time. And the, 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 what, the, what the colophon says is, uh, in a, said in a situation where the monks felt that the end of the world was approaching. And this sweeping persecution, which I mentioned in 577 and 78, was to the monks only the harbinger of the final days of doom which were going to come. And most ominous of this impending disaster was that the sacred scriptures made of paper and silk were disappearing. They were burned, going up in flames. And there was a prophecy that when the scriptures start to disappear, then the end is at hand. And this is one of the reasons why the monks entrusted their teachings to the mountain under the open sky. In, in the colophones, they give the reasons. And I read you a bit from these colophones. Knowing that the Vast horses of heaven have been long deficient in discerning that the earth's pillow, pivot is near collapse. They sighed that yet the great blue sea also changes. I mean, that's the Pacific Ocean. So it's, and then bemoaned that even Mount Tai falls, the highest mountain, the most highly, holiest mountain in Shandong. But then they 
strike an optimistic note, and they say, from now on, when this engraved text encounters the inferno at the end of the eon, it will not be consumed, and when it's divine, something we cannot read, faces those scorching winds, it will forever abide. And this refers to this inferno which will destroy the world as we know it. Yet the engraved sutras will survive into the next world age, and it, then it says, silk and bamboo are easily ruined, but metal and stone are hard to destroy. We saw these two characters, metal and stone are hard to destroy. Entrusting the text to a high mountain, they will last forever without end. Thus, that was the hope of the monks in the next world age. These texts would still be there. I mean, the, the, Chinese, or the Buddhist end of the world is not a complete ending like in Christianity where you have the last judgment and then nothing after that. In Buddhism, you have a new world coming after our world with a new Buddha. But I mean, most of the present world will disintegrate and disappear. But the monks felt or ha hoped that their engravings in stone would still survive the days of doom. Of course, the monks had no doubt that everybody in the next world age will read Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> Now, uh, just the last sutra I want to uh, show you briefly. It is here on Mount Tai, which I mentioned already several times. It was the axis starts from here, from Mount Tai to Mount E. And uh, this is the largest sutra in China. It has a square, 2,000 square meters, and uh, 1,800 characters are engraved on this sutra. This is the photo which you had on the flyer. And these columns coming down, cascading low, like waves, waves, like the water that originally fl flowed over, over these rocks, over the rock surface. And the characters have been recently colored in red. They are colored every other decade or two, three decades. And for example, the character Law here is uh, carved over the, um, over the uh, uh, step in the, in the rock. So you see how they carved this character in there. And our group has measured all the, every single character. And uh, we, we, that's where we sit there and do this. It's great fun. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, Another unusual thing at this side is at this site is the colophones. There are 60, more than 60 colophones, that is paratexts, later editions, which have been engraved uh, into near the sutra. And for example, here, these are these colophones here, and this is the colophone. Uh, this is the sutra text, right? <clears throat> and these colophones. Uh, uh, form a kind of symbiosis with the original um, sutra text engraved. And this is comparable to colophones on Chinese paintings or calligraphies for that matter, of hand scrolls. For example, I'm just showing uh, one scroll, famous scroll in the Princeton Art, uh, University Art Museum by so Wang Xiche, the f most famous calligraphy or calligrapher of China. A Tang Dynasty copy, but this is uh, this is his letter, and all the rest are colophones. So the 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 colophones and the original primary text and secondary text form a spatial and material and historical symbiosis. And the same happens here with these colophones in around the sutra. And this is an indication that the original Buddhist uh, quality of the sutra was kind of diluted and that the um, text became literal, became, a, became an object of literati uh, attention. The literati wrote these colophones, they were not necessarily d deep Buddhist believers, but they wrote these colophones like you write colophones on uh, on two hand scrolls. And this year, exactly this year, we are 
working on these colophons and we find all kinds of interesting political, especially in personal uh, uh, associations which go with these colophones, why these people wrote, wrote these colophones. And one of them uh, wrote this colophone here <coughs> on the top of Mount Tai, uh, apart away from the sutra. And uh, he, this is a man called Yuan Hongyu, and the date it is date in March 19, 1562. And the colophone says, gazing towards the sea which is on the peak of the mountain. The mountain is 1,445 meters high. And on a very, very clear day, you could probably, if you go, if you go up, up here, I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> this is not yet. <laughs> if you go up here, maybe you could look and see the Pacific Ocean. But as you see, saw, there are still many, many things to study. And maybe this uh, year in the summer we go on this path. We're not sure yet whether we should. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, if any of you wants to go first, <laughs> you're quite, let me know. Just let me know. Uh, now, I have talked a lot. I, I, I could still show you some technical aspects of our work if you want to. Can we do this? Just a few more slides. Yeah. Um, I mean, yes, I'll do this. Um, all what I have shown you is, of course, uh, the fruit of much labor and intensive labor of, of our, our of effort, of our group. And I'm just showing you a few slides, what, how we do it, what we do. Uh, this is the scaffolding. What is this? Uh, <laughs> scaffolding broke down. Uh, ah, yeah. A scaffolding um, in one of the caves which we, where we worked. This is not now, this is not in Shandong province, but in Shanxi province. In this cave, the walls are seven meters high. And the, unfortunately, they slant towards the inside. So the camera always has to be kept at the same distance. And we built, I mean, my son actually, who is an architect, built this scaffold, little camera, camera hold uh, thing to hold the camera. And uh, with the laser, we uh, measure the distance from the camera to the, to the wall and then uh, this is the uh, design, and uh, we then we sit down in the, in the, on the ground, and we have the computer, and we release the shutter. We don't have to go up here. We release the shutter from the computer. And this is just one thing. How it's very com complicated to do this. And then another thing is that what we use is the RTI. A method that is reflection transformation imaging method. And here we tried this out on a medieval tombstone in Heidelberg, near this a medieval city uh, church in Heidelberg. And this engraving you can see it looks pretty murky. It's hard to read. But there is this technology you put some b balls, two balls here in front, they're just perfectly round, and then from various angles you take, um, with a flash, you take f uh, shots, and then these many different selections uh, with the software are brought into a very visible uh, image. So you see this is what, what the, to the naked eye, that's what the, uh, it looks like, and then if with this technology you can read this here. And it's, I was also amazed. <laughs> and we, we tried this, I mean, we applied this in, in, our, uh, in our sutras. And uh, for example, here, this is this wall in this cave again. And here uh, you have a super inscription. This is dated, uh, this is dated, uh, wait a minute. Um, uh, 1114, and uh, this inscription is, has been 
Im imposed on the sutra text below. But with this technology, we can read the sutra text like here, you see? This is the sutra text, and it can be read. I mean, it's wonderful for us to read this. So uh, this is just, these are just two examples for the photography technology. And then, of course, we use a huge database, and I just show you two screenshots. Uh, we use the TEI, Text Encoding Initiative System, for all our texts, and um, the idea is that it prevents our data to become obsolete in, in, in a few years' time. I mean, because this TIA, we are told, will last forever. And uh, then we have this all, all our data in this TEI database, and from that database we can extract the publications, and we can also use it for the web, web application from the same source. And uh, this is a screenshot of one, just the bibliography of one of our volumes, and then this is a screenshot here of the inscriptions, and we note all the differences of our in, in, of the engraved texts from the official version in the Taisho Tripitaka or and other versions. And fortunately, the, as you may know, the Taisho Tripitaka is the largest uh, canon in uh, of Buddhist canons. There have been many Buddhist canons over the dec decades and centuries, and this Taisho canon was done by the Japanese in the 20s and 30s, and it has now been put into digitized form, and they use the same system as we do TEI, so it's good for us. We can uh, work with this very easily, and uh, the original Taisho Japanese canon had 100 million characters, but now they have put these new texts, which they from other canons, and now it has 213 million characters in that database. And these Buddhists put it all on a disk, and they distribute it for free. You, they do it just because they want to distribute and propagate their faith. It's done in Taiwan, and they send us a new disk every year. So we are very happy to work on this, and, but I can tell you that this here takes, of course, hundreds of hours to prepare these, uh, these databases. But now I think we should go back to the mountain, and I uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> If you, if you still have questions, uh, I'm happy to answer, if I can, if I can. Yes, please. There, there are microphones, I'm told, there are microphones. There is a microphone. Um, so you, earlier you were talking about how um, there might be pilgrimages, uh, pilgrimage to these sites where um, people might sit in front of these scriptures and meditate. Um, and I'm thinking about uh, the Christian, um, the, in, in, the, in, in, Euro, in medieval Europe, they mostly use paintings instead of uh, written words to convey um, their, their faith, their stories, um, because they were expecting that the, um, most people, most of their audience would be illiterate. So the, uh, come back to this Chinese um, context, in, in fifth century, sixth century AD, I can't imagine that the literacy rate would be very high. So, what would be the tar their target audience? What kind of people do they target? And um, why do we see mostly written words instead of paintings? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, the literacy certainly was not so high for the general population. 
and but uh, uh, these texts where the where the monks where we think the monks meditated in front they probably knew by heart they and they may also have known by heart this text about the description of the mountain of Lanka where they walk up uh, but that doesn't of course ex doesn't mean that they didn't at some point in their lives were able to read this what I'm just saying is that they didn't have to read it all the time uh, but uh, it's a it's a very good question and uh, about the literacy of course the monks were literate and we assume that the monks were the audience of this of these inscriptions but we have uh, three types of donors and the donor inscriptions give us a clue who else could read these in the three levels so to speak they are very simple people who give money to donate uh, some of these inscriptions and they may have been able to read or may not have been able to read maybe things were read to them by the monks and then there is a second layer and this i mean sociolo sociological layer and there are many military people amazing many military people are involved in giving uh, these inscriptions and also many women amazingly are involved as i mentioned uh, they it can tell us something about the role of women, the importance of women in that society. So they, there we can assume they, they were able to read. And then the third level is the imperial, uh, imperial stratum. And there is very little. There is one inscription where we have one person who is somehow related to the imperial family, but that's all in, here in Shandong. Does this answer your question? Somewhat? <laughs> so there is, there is the, I think there in, in Chinese tradition, there is this um, kind of awe or respect for written words, like yeah. in, despite what it means, like people would burn papers where there are written words, um, like they're sacred or something. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, was, I was thinking maybe um, some of the donors, maybe even if they don't, if they, even if they can't read the words, they would still uh, just treat it, assume it's something. Yeah, yeah I think that you have extremely uh, perceptive, this remark. I mean, there is this veneration for the written character of the written word in China, it goes through all of Chinese history until now. I mean, I mean, think of Mao Zedong writing with a brush. I mean, President Trump wouldn't do this. <laughs> <laughs> One question, um, how do you find these inscriptions and what do you, how do you make sure you don't miss some yeah, of them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a good <laughs> question. M many um, I mean, m most, most or many of the inscriptions are pointed out to us by Chinese colleagues. And, but we have already f also found new ones. It's amazing. You always still find new ones. And uh, just to the uh, first, the first uh, slides which I showed in this, is there a way to go back here? No, maybe not. Um, where I showed you this barren landscape in Shandong with the gray rock and there was this Dakung Wangfo in there. This was discovered only in around 1990. And it was discovered by a shepherd. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. This one here, here. Yeah, no, yes, back. Uh, yeah, here, this area. I mean, nobody goes there. And uh, there, a shepherd goes, went there, a shepherd went up here and he, with his flock of sheep, he w walks around and it takes him one day. And the sheep just eat the little grass thing which is still left there. And every day he goes around one day and, and then he comes down. And suddenly this shepherd, I mean, the sheep took another route or whatever and, and the, somewhere here, the shepherd discovered these inscriptions. 
and he didn't know what it was. And so he went to the local party secretary and said, I discovered these inscriptions. And so the party secretary uh, had this friend, Zhang Zung, and Zhang Zung was a big, great scholar, and he told us. And so that's how we got there. I mean, we were not the first, but I mean, then this was, uh, so to speak, newly discovered by this shepherd. It's amazing. And uh, actually, maybe I should just tell you the story. I went up there one day and uh, just to get to survey the landscape and walked around here and so on. And it's wonderful to walk there, you know, completely alone. And there was another shepherd. <laughs> and the shepherd, <laughs> the shepherd may have been the son of the, or nephew or whatever of this other shepherd. And, and uh, what do you talk about with a shepherd? I mean, <laughs> so I asked him, I said, I, just to start the conversation, I said, how many sheep do you have? And, <laughs> And he said, well, I have 43. Do you want to buy one? <laughs> <laughs> well, but this, this, I mean, about discovering. But we, we also discovered, we also discovered few, a few inscriptions by going through into the records. There are these records of, uh, Start in the 18th century, 19th century, even 20th century, and people say we have visited such and such a place and we have seen such and such an inscription. And then we go there and when we can find it. Yes, yes, please. <clears throat> I think most museums are more concerned with conservation than restoration yeah. because these particular uh, artifacts are out in the weather and will eventually disappear. Is restoration ever a option for recarving uh, some of the uh, literature? Yeah, <laughs> this is uh, again a very good question. I mean, these things have been out there for 1500 years and they don't get better. And uh, the, there have been many thoughts have been given to what to do. And uh, one is to, uh, in the case of Taishan, to d divert the water which was flowing over the rocks to, to the side. But this was not necessarily a good measure. It's very hard, yeah, it's very hard because the water mitigates the changes in temperature between winter and summer. And if, they, if you don't have the water on top, then you have the very hot sun, and then you also have the icy frost in the winter, and it, the things crack. So it's very difficult. There have been suggestions by our Chinese colleagues to recarve the inscriptions, but we shudder at that idea, you know. We don't want them to recall the, the, the inscriptions because these are monuments, uh, these are documents of the sixth century, and if you recall them, then they're lost in a way. So it's actually a no win situation. It's very sad in a way. Uh, but uh, this is granite. M this here is granite stone, and granite is, of course, very durable. In Sichuan, where I showed you the scaffolding thing, the cave, this is sandstone, and that's not so durable. And uh, there are different problems. But uh, basically, it makes, makes your heart bleed. Or, or you, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it will be, it's doomed to disappear sometime, maybe in 500 years or so. But, uh, but the, the one reason, I think, uh, one reason why the Chinese government allows us to do this, and it's amazing that we can do this. I mean, it's really, I mean, I don't know of any other project of this size where we have, which has such a support of the Chinese authorities. And uh, I think one of the reasons is that they know that we document the, these inscriptions as good as we can now, and then in 50 years' time or so, whatever, at least we can say in the year 2018, it looked like that. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yes, yes, uh, yeah, uh, yes, please. Can oh, you yeah. tell us a little bit about the actual s content of the sutra, that very large sutra that was the last one that, uh, where the water flows over? Yeah, the, 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 the sutra, the uh, diamond sutra with the water oh. flowing oh, over. Oh, that's yeah. what it is. It's the diamond sutra. It's a diamond sutra. Oh, yeah. okay. And the diamond sutra, um, it's one of the key texts in, in, in uh, Buddhism and it has 5,000 characters and that's why it is often, re relatively often engraved. We have several versions of the Diamond Sutra. In, in Shandong is one, and, but in Sichuan there are several. And here in Shandong it's only half of the Diamond Sutra is engraved. 2005, I mean originally maybe something like 2,500 characters. And what is left is 1,800 something characters. Would this have been the, the, the pith of the sutra, the, the heart but of this? Would this have been the heart of the sutra, the pith? I mean, what was left, this half? Was it, uh, yeah. do you know which half? Or yeah, yeah, yes, we can read every character. No, 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 we cannot read every character, but we can read. We know what was there. Mm -hmm. Although on the left side of the big surface, there, this is where the water ran down, and there it has disappeared. And unfortunately, on the left side, where one would expect a colophon, like on the Mount Thie, they, normally there's a colophon on the left, this is completely gone. And we have no idea, I mean, we have no clue, oh no, yes, when, when the sutra was carved and by whom, which is very sad because it's the biggest sutra engraving in all of China, actually, not only in Shandong. And from the start, and, and for centuries, actually, people have, this was known, this uh, was known, it's not one of these newly discovered because it's so large and it was never forgotten. Uh, and people for centuries have mused about the question, who, who wrote this? And in the beginning there was, they said, oh, this is Wang Xiche, this famous calligraphy of the fourth century. But then other very interesting people, a very interesting argument in the 18th century, somebody used a stylistic argument. And he said, the style of Wang Xiche is quite different from this, but there is another engraving on the, um, another mountain in Shandong, Tsulai Shan, which I showed briefly. And uh, this has a name of the engraver. And this person in the 18th century uh, said uh, this engraver may also have done the sutra on Taishan because the style is similar. It's very interesting as an argument, stylistic argument. But today we cannot, we do not think that we can ascribe the sutra to a particular person. But it, from the style, uh, it must be date in this period, 580 something. Question? Uh, there, <clears throat> there is a tradition in uh, Chinese art of um, production of art, uh, gaining karmic uh, value, uh, particularly for one's uh, ancestors or uh, for oneself. So my question is, um, is that the case for the carving of the sutras, that one would gain uh, karmic value. And to what extent um, did the emperors act as patrons uh, to produce this artwork? Yeah, very, thank you. Uh, good, good, important point. Um, the sutras talk, I mean, it's always implied that the donation of a sutra brings you merit and merit in for better rebirth or what for for yeah for your personal well-being but it also implies your ancestors and it it says sometimes specifically uh, i gave we give this sutra in the hope that all our family members up to the seventh generation before us will benefit from this, and they, if they languish somewhere in, in the realm of uh, existence of animals, there may be the next rebirth they will get up. But it, there are also very interesting uh, um, inscription, um, a very interesting donor inscription in Sichuan, which we just discovered recently, and and it says 
we give this for the psychic well-being of such and such a daughter, we, who obviously had a psychic disturbance or something. Bu An, it says. Bu, she is not even, not, 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 uh, yeah, disturbed. And, and this was given for her. It's very moving, you know, it's very moving. <laughs> I think this is a good moment to end. We have, um, this could probably go on for forever. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Professor Lederose, for a fascinating talk and for overwhelming images and overwhelming data. Uh, I think we learned a lot about the power of religion and how, <clears throat> how it can um, build, help to build empires, the power, maybe the soft power of characters and scriptures that can convert real landscapes into a Buddhist uh, realm. And I think we also learned once more how important it is to stay attuned with the latest technological developments with digit, in the digital <laughs> world. It doesn't only help the scientists, it helps us in the field of humanities, but also here at the museum and in the field of uh, education. I also wanted to give a belated welcome and thank you for all the students who have come from universities, from Denison University, from Case Western University, Ohio State University, I hope I haven't forgotten, uh, but welcome and thank you for coming uh, to, this, uh, to this lecture. Uh, and of course, I would like to thank uh, you, Pauline and Joseph Degenfelder for having made once more uh, another lecture on Chinese art possible. Before you all leave, let me announce the speaker of our next lecture in Chinese art. This will be in 2019. Mimi Gardner, Dr. Mimi Gardner Gates, Director Emeritus of the Seattle Art Museum of, um, and Chairman of the Dunhuang Foundation. She will take us to a UNESCO World Heritage Site on the Silk Road in her lecture, Caves of Dunhuang, Buddhist Art on China's Silk Road. Goodbye for now and see you again latest next year in this auditorium. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.